This is a special edition of the Daily Article Podcast. Today is Thursday, May the 30th, 2024. I'm Chris Elkins, narrating this special edition article written by Denison Forum co-founder and CEO, Dr. Jim Denison. Donald J. Trump has been convicted in his hush money Manhattan trial. He is the first former American president to be found guilty of a crime. The presiding judge, Justice Juan Merchan, now faces the task of sentencing Mr. Trump. A prison sentence is considered unlikely. Penalties could range from a fine to probation. Mr. Trump is also certain to appeal a process that could take months or years to resolve. As Time notes, the judge's decision will reverberate across the political landscape and, depending on the timing, could greatly affect the election in November. We will know much more about this verdict over coming days. Since our nonpartisan ministry offers biblical responses to cultural issues, I will not react politically or personally to today's announcement. Rather, I want to think with you about some cultural ramifications of the jury's decision in the light of biblical truth. King David testified in the first part of Psalm 20, verse 7, Some trust in chariots and some in horses. Chariots and horses were the military instruments of the day akin to tanks and fighter jets today. By contrast, David responded in the remainder of verse 7, We trust in the name of the Lord our God. His reasoning was simple and persuasive as seen in verse 8. They collapse and fall, but we rise and stand upright. He was right as seen in Psalm 33 verses 16 and 17. The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation, and by its great might it cannot rescue. The prophet warned in Isaiah 31 verse 1, Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses, who trust in chariots because they are many, and in horsemen because they are very strong, but do not look to the Holy One of Israel or consult the Lord. Politics are vitally important, of course. The massive issues of our day, from the war in Gaza to global hotspots like Taiwan, North Korea, Ukraine, and Iran, are all manifestly political in nature. At the same time, politics are a means to larger ends. Thomas Jefferson was adamant, quote, The care of human life and happiness, and not their destruction, is the first and only object of good government. End quote. C.S. Lewis agreed, writing in Mere Christianity, quote, It is easy to think the state has a lot of different objects, military, political, economic, and whatnot. But in a way, things are much simpler than that. The state exists simply to promote and to protect the ordinary happiness of human beings in this life. End quote. Here's the problem. No matter who is president and what party controls our government, you and I can never be truly happy in this fallen world. St. Augustine confessed, In adverse circumstances, I long for prosperity, and in times of prosperity, I dread adversity. Augustine therefore asked, Is not human life on earth a time of testing without respite? And he prayed, On your exceedingly great mercy, and on that alone, Rest all my hope. Chuck Colson wisely reminded us that salvation will not arrive on Air Force One. This is why from Philippians 3 verse 20, we eagerly wait for the Savior, whose return is from Titus 2 verse 13, our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. On that day, we will say with the prophet from Isaiah 25, verse 9, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. In the meantime, Jesus taught us in John 6, verse 27, Do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life. At the same time, he commissioned us in Matthew 28, verse 19, to make disciples of all nations, as we, from Matthew 5, verse 16, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. The balance is crucial. 
Our citizenship is in heaven, claims Philippians 3, verse 20. But from 2 Corinthians 5, 20, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us in this world. One way to conjoin our trust in God as our only king with engagement in the politics of our day is to pray to the former for his blessing on the latter. Offering thoughts and prayers in times of crisis is much criticized in our secular culture, but the Apostle Paul disagreed, imploring the Corinthians from 2 Corinthians 1 verse 11, You also must help us by prayer. If the greatest theologian and missionary in Christian history needed the intercession of one of the most troubled and immature churches in the New Testament, God can use your prayer and mine to change our nation today. Alfred Lord Tennyson wrote, More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. Wherefore, let thy voice rise like a fountain for me night and day. For what are men better than sheep or goats that nourish a blind life within the brain, if, knowing God, they lift not hands of prayer, both for themselves and those who who call them friend. For so the whole round earth is every way bound by gold chains around the feet of God. So let me ask, have you prayed for our nation in this historic and divisive hour? Have you prayed for our leaders as commanded by Scripture in 1 Timothy 2 verse 2? Have you prayed for God to redeem these disruptive days by using them to show America our need for His wisdom, forgiveness, and healing grace? Have you asked Him to use your intercession and witness as the salt and light we so desperately need? Why not right now? We're grateful for our podcast listeners. If you find the Daily Article podcast helps you better understand today's news and cultural issues and then respond biblically, please rate and review the Daily Article podcast on the platform from which you subscribe. That helps people find and follow the Daily Article podcast. 